So if any of you have any questions, uh, and the governor can't answer them, and he can answer most of these, because he's actually by training a geologist, but you can also ask uh, Carlos. Uh, but really is a privilege to have John Hickenlooper with us here today. He's been a very good friend of the Aspen Institute, coming up from Denver at various times to talk to our audiences. And it's no surprise that we invite him as often as we do, because he really is one of the most respected governors in the country, and I say that in an entirely bipartisan manner. Uh, it's no accident that he himself uh, was a very successful entrepreneur, so he's created an environment here that is extremely pro-business, and the enormous success of Colorado economically can be attributed to many of his policies, perhaps the lowest unemployment rate in the country, becoming a magnet for technology firms. Uh, he also has been an ardent environmentalist the entire time and has done extraordinary things to preserve what you see behind us. And that shows that one can, in fact, be both pro-business and, and pro-environment. Uh, before his election to governor, he was an enormously successful uh, mayor of uh, Denver. That's actually surprisingly very rare. It's been, I think it was a century and a half or something since a mayor of Denver became elected governor of the state. And as I said, a trained geologist, he uh, then became uh, very successful in the beer business. And for those of you interested in, in seeing this extraordinary uh, trajectory uh, from successful entrepreneur to mayor to governor to someone frequently talked about for a national uh, elective office, uh, his autobiography will soon be out, won't it, Governor? It's out. It's out now. Uh, the Opposite of Woe, My Life in Beer and Politics. <laughs> so, uh, not, not too many could write, have a title like that, and it'd be about making beer as opposed to drinking beer. <laughs> so, all right, let's, let's get started. Governor, um, I th you know, citing the, 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 uh, the great Justice Brandeis, who said states are laboratories of democracy. Uh, the governor has said that states are laboratories for uh, uh, securing secure and safe energy. And you said that before President Trump was elected. And since that time, uh, he has announced many policies that might be inconsistent with the policies that you might be supporting in national office. I, I wonder how you, as the governor of Colorado, in the sense of how states can be uh, laboratories of clean energy are now either because of those actions or despite those actions, assuring that Colorado does everything possible to have a secure and safe <coughs> and clean energy future. Sure. And I thank you, Elliot, and thank you. Uh, I mean, I don't want to miss an opportunity to recognize and celebrate the Aspen Institute. It's a, a gift to have something like the Aspen Institute in Colorado. Um, that really is an internationally recognized, a globally recognized uh, convener of, of ideas and action. Uh, and, and being here, which I've never seen this little amphitheater, I've been up here a million times, but when I came, I was up in Aspen two years ago, and a group of us hiked up over the Maroon Bells and down to Crested Butte. And so if you've never done that, that hike, let me tell you, it is spectacular. We went right in, in actually in August. And the wildflowers are up to our waist. Uh, absolutely breathtaking. Anyway, uh, back to renewable energy uh, and, and really just clean energy. I think what energy. The, the goal here is to have an energy, an energy system that is as reliable. Uh, you know, it's not going to break down or, or fall apart. As reliable and as inexpensive as the system we have now, but one that doesn't emit carbon and one that is as much as possible clean in, in terms of all kinds of emissions or pollution that might come from the generation of that power. So we've been working on this since since I got elected mayor of Denver in 2003. And I, I'm one of those people I never ran for student council. I don't want to offend anybody, but I really didn't hang out with the people that did. <laughs> um, and really kind of got goaded into running for mayor in 2003 just on the notion that a small business person at that time I owned about 14 restaurants and that uh, the lessons of small business could come into and, and help inform how to how to make government make a city government work and then ultimately how to try to make a state government work and a big part of that is right now as we look at the the, the president removing 
the entire country from the commitment to the Paris ag uh, agreements, what can, it's not just states, what can state and local communities do in, in response and, and try and figure out in specific language what we can do that will take us to and, and get us in compliance with those accords and hopefully go beyond those accords. I, I think I remember you saying when, when the president announced that he was not going to abide any longer by the Paris Accords, you said it was something like uh, you know, ripping the parachute off <laughs> when you should be ripping the ripcord. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, so as a result of that, the United States doesn't have figuratively, literally, uh, a seat at the table. Is there a way for you and your fellow governors and, 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 and progressive mayors to effectively have some seat at, seat at that table? Yeah, I think, I think there's a lot of opportunity. And I think we're trying to look at partnering with different states in different ways. Uh, we've been talking to Montana uh, and the governor up there, Steve Bullock, is a, has become a good friend of mine. And I mean, I love it's what's so interesting is governors are so different than legislators and senators or congressional representatives. Because governors kind of like working together, you know, Republicans and Democrats. And they have a job. They have to do something. Well, right, and, 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 well <laughs> the buck stops here, right? It, it, we, it, at the end, we have to make the decision. We have to balance our budget every year. And we have to look at the long-term decisions that are going to have a lasting impact on the people <clears throat> of our states. So uh, we've talked to Republican governors and Democratic governors, uh, most recently with, with Governor Bullock, to look at some of the or all the different things we can do and, and how do we get mag, maximum impact? What are the things they're doing? What are the things we're doing? And, and it's funny, I think it's, I mean, this should never be a political <clears throat> game. Uh, and we tried to let this last legislative session to <clears throat> propose uh, bills that would close a couple of coal plants. Uh, and again, we hold right at the top, we recognize that people's household budgets, for most of the people in Colorado, it's a, it's a battle that those household budgets, they matter. But we think we found a way that we can close a couple coal plants and actually, absolutely, in real dollars, hold those household budgets harmless, right? And, and maybe, we haven't quite figured this out, but hopefully in the next couple of months, find a way that we can actually close a couple coal plants and have people's electricity bill go down. And that's where the magic really happens and, and where things really change, then you are fulfilling that promise of a, 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 an as reliable system of, of delivering energy that's, you know, uh, the same price or cheaper. I mean, that'd be, if you can say it's cheaper, that transforms the conversation. <laughs> right. uh, and it's clean. I, I mean, we, and it's not perfectly clean. I mean, closing, closing coal plants doesn't mean you're at, the, at your destination. But closing coal plants does allow you to do a lot more wind and solar, which are intermittent. And cycling up a, coal, a, a natural gas plant is much, much, much cleaner than trying to cycle up a coal plant. Uh, and these days, now it's cheaper. I mean, natural gas is so inexpensive. You know, Governor, uh, one reason you're so highly regarded in this state and then people are looking to you from the rest of the country is that this is essentially a purple state. It's about one third Democrats, one third Republicans, one third independents. It, you've had this ability to bring very diverse groups together toward a common purpose. For example, you know, even the Environmental Defense Fund and the oil and gas industry together for regulations, for example, involving methane. How do you how do you do that? <laughs> Well, in a, in a funny way, you just ask. I, you know, we've become so polarized. Uh, and, and it's funny, we, we Democrats get stuck with this, with this image that we're only for big government and also that we want to promote bureaucracy and red tape. That has nothing to do with the Democratic Party, in my mind. We do believe that we have to have a regulatory framework. And when I got elected governor, I said, we want to make this the most pro-business state in the country with the highest environmental standards and the highest ethical standards. Pro-business, but with high standards. So when we began getting numbers of the amount of pollution coming off, escaping what they call fugitive emissions, methane escaping from oil and gas wells around the state, I, I sat down with the, the largest and I felt most responsible oil and gas companies that operated in the state. I said, listen, you guys have a social contract with the people of Colorado and, and that you get to operate here but you cannot 
you know, allow this kind of pollution. And we looked, I showed them some of the studies. Uh, and they, to their credit, said, well, you know, every time we get into a, a, a negotiation, we always get, we, we're, we're always t turned out to be the bad guys. And, you know, everything gets rammed down our throat. I said, I made three commitments. I said, one, we won't create bureaucracy and red tape. Two, every dollar that you spend is going to go towards actually making the air cleaner. And then three, once we get these, these agreements done, this, this, regu this new regulatory framework that'll be binding, once we get this done, you will stand side by side with the environmental community and both sides will take credit and, get, and share in the glory of something that hasn't been done in another state. So it, it took four months. We had the scientists from the environmental community. Uh, we had scientists from the oil and gas industry. For the first four months, they just looked at all the studies and had to negotiate the terms. What does the science really say? Because it's not as black and white as, as we often think. And then as they did, once they got through that, then they started looking at, all right, what are the things we can do to make maximum impact in getting rid of these fugitive emissions? And over the course of about, I think that was seven or eight months of negotiation, uh, and, and there were several times where one side or the other would leave the room. And, and our job was just to be the convener and, to, and kind of the fair witness to when they start to leave the room. I had, on three or four occasions, I was called in as the authority figure. It's a difficult transition to imagine, I understand. Um, but I would get the, you know, I would go and talk to whoever was unhappy and calm them down and get them back to the table. Anyway, long, long story short, we ended up putting in the first fugitive emissions regulatory framework in the country. Uh, the oil and gas industry accepted $60 million a year. That was what the initial cost was going to be per year to capture all these, uh, to, to go visit every well three or four times a year if there were fugitive emissions. Uh, it, once they'd fixed all those and that they could go a couple times, at least once a year, and to make sure that those, uh, in those places where they were uh, flaring or venting, that they would capture that, that natural gas and make sure they used it. And part of the argument was this was energy. Not only do you want to, I mean, putting methane up into the atmosphere is a terrible pollutant, but it's also energy that should be used. So they agreed to that. And we had a press conference where we had the Colorado Environmental Coalition, we had the Environmental Defense Fund, the, the Nature Conservancy, standing side by side with the CEOs of some of the largest oil and gas companies saying, all right, this is, this is a success. And I think that's, that doesn't happen often it, it enough doesn't, anymore. And that's sort of a metaphor of what the Aspen Institute tries to do in many contexts. You know, and language is important when we talk about these things too. Uh, for example, with respect to climate change, I want to get your views about how climate change may already be affecting Colorado. Is it, is it, do you find it better to talk with people about things like clean water and clear, clean air rather than an abstract notion like climate change, especially when it's sort of become dogma in, on the part of many people in one party to deny what climate change might mean? Yeah, I think it, and it's become more than dogma. I think it's become catma. Uh, which, is, which is even more difficult to deal with. Um, I think that, that... And you'll define that for us. <laughs> at the end, at the end, when everyone's ready. Um, get, get ready. I, I think that the, it, it is always easier to, when you're talking about big issues, to be able to talk in concrete you know, realities for people that they understand rather than the scientific kind of philosophic stuff. You, I mean, if you, I think you've got to be able to talk about that as well and try and put that in concrete terms as well. But, you know, Colorado, almost everyone, not everyone, almost everyone understands how precious water is. And it's really at the beginning of almost every conversation we have about the long-term future of the state. Uh, we finished two years ago the first uh, statewide Colorado water plan where we had over 30,000 people contributed and participated to the the three-year process to create that. We look at, at what climate change could mean to the water and, and to really uh, our agricultural uses, our recreational uses, and, and just the in-stream flows that allow us to have uh, unbelievable habitat for an incredible variety of, of flora and fauna. And you know, half of our water storage, and it's hard to imagine this, you know, we have reservoirs around the state and, the West is a very difficult place to store water. Most of these surface reservoirs are relatively shallow, so there's a lot of evaporation. We have a dry climate in the summer. Uh, 
it's not the best case. We're trying to experiment with storing more water in old, depleted groundwater reservoirs, so you don't have all this evaporation. It is hopefully more efficient. But half of our storage is in the snow, our snowpack. And, and it's hard for people to get their arms around that, but if we change just a degree or two so that that precipitation doesn't get stored as snow, we run into real trouble making sure that we have water for you know, urban uses and agricultural uses. One of the real challenges is saying, all right, if that's true, how do we prepare for it? Do we build bigger reservoirs? Uh, and, and certainly we're looking at different ways of storage, but I think the state of Colorado, we're past the place where we're gonna propose any big reservoirs. Every time, I've had a couple of groups come propose to me with, you know, should we go back and look at uh, uh, two forks, you know, the, was it three forks or two forks? I can't remember. It was when I was a kid, I was almost still a geologist. I don't remember. I haven't been a practicing geologist since 1986. Um, anyway, I, every time someone suggests a big reservoir, I say, that's crazy. No one's going to want that. No one's going to put up with that. So we've got to look at alternatives, and the alternatives are there. There's, there's, ground, there's storage in the old groundwater reservoirs, but there's also looking at conservation. And we pushed when we made the Colorado Water Plan, we put conservation at the beginning of every conversation. And conservation allows, especially when you recognize that 80 to 85 percent of our water is used in agricultural uses, right? Agriculture and some commercial uses. And right now, the way water law is, there's very small incentive for farmers and ranchers to find ways to grow the same amount of hay or winter wheat or anything, but use less water. They don't get a benefit from that, and they risk losing water rights if they don't consistently use them, which is it's bizarre. It's from a time when we had all the water we could imagine and no one really even could, have, could think about conservation. So I think that's the, what we're working on now is trying to say, all right, how, which of these laws that we can change gradually? Because we don't want to, you know, people's water rights in this state and most of the West are, are private property that for many families is what they hope to pass down to their kids and their grandkids. So we can't, we can't disturb or diminish those water rights. But we can find ways that where those water rights can incorporate incentives to be more conservation minded. Uh, and we've made a couple of, we have a couple of pilots going on right now. And I think that's one place where when you look at climate change and we don't have storage, we're going to have to really push and think about uh, and be much more conservation minded. Well, are there examples already of climate change effects on Colorado? I mean, sitting in a place like this in such a sublime environment, looking at things that probably haven't looked different in millions of years. The Ute Indians thousands of years ago saw this same view. Is this already being affected by climate change? It's hard to say, and I, I get in trouble. My environmental friends, you know, my, my son's godfather, I have a son who's 15, his, father, his godfather is a guy named Kirk Johnson, who used to be the chief scientist at the Museum of Nature and Science in, De in mm -hmm. Denver. And he's now the CEO at the Smithsonian Museum of, of, of Nature and Science and, or of Natural Science. Natural, uh, natural in, History in, in Washington. Natural History in Washington. And Kirk and I get in this battle. You know, the cycles of climate change and how it happens, uh, we are making great advances in understanding it. But if you go down to Mesa Verde, right, that's only 400 years ago. And it looks like what happened there was a lot of water for a long period of time and then suddenly drought and a lot of drought going on and on and on. And so finally, that whole civilization had to move. And we've seen uh, the Mayan civilization at a different, you know, a couple hundred years earlier than that went through the same kinds of changes. It's, it's not clear. There certainly wasn't a lot of carbon emissions. And it could have been some sort of a volcanic eruption. Uh, they're trying to connect these, uh, these experiences of great climate change with real geologic events that we can we can find most giant eruptions you can find in the geologic record they don't seem to line up at this point so they're still trying to figure that out so i we do see some evidence of, of climate change a lot of people are looking at it and reporting it but there's so much noise i mean the droughts we had during the great depression again long before we were burning these huge amounts of carbon they were profound and the dust bowl the dust bowl the the the, the uh, there's a book out uh by timothy egan called the, the, big, the, great, the big Burn. And it talks about the creation of the National Forest Service in, in, in terms of the wildfires of, I think it was 1911 or 1912, but they dwarf any wildfires we've seen. So 
these cycles are there. I think what the real fact is... And they're continuing now. Your, your fellow Governor Ducey from Arizona was here three days ago and he had to go back to Arizona because of the forest fires. We were supposed to be on a couple panels in the forest fire. We've got a pretty <laughs> serious forest fire right now in Colorado down in Durango that we're monitoring. Literally, I'm getting reports every hour or two. Uh, these are, are serious issues, but we've seen them before. I think the climate change, the more serious concern to me are the global issues. I, th I look at the oceans and we're a long way from the ocean, but the uh, acidification of the oceans, the, the, the killing off of corals, which we can see real time, and that ha we haven't seen that happen. I'd love to hear the governor of Colorado talking about oceans. And let me, <laughs> let me actually put in a pitch for those of you to come to a 1020 session this morning. The Aspen Institute is about to launch a massive new program on ocean conservation with the goal of actually putting all of the high seas around the planet in, in, into protection. But, but so, so consider Well, and there's a reception uh, for Sylvia Earle. And the, Sylvia and the movie is on part there, of that effort, at, and you at, should come. At, at five o'clock. There's a reception with Sylvia Earle, her deepness, what, the foremost oceanographer in the world. Please come to that in Dora Hosier and come to her, 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 uh, her panel at 10, 10, 10, 20. I think you'll be fascinated by it. And one of the producers of that film talked about small worlds. His mother was my godmother. Oh my God. <laughs> just, just, I'm not saying it's, you know, God or a bowl of light. I'm just saying it's a small world. Well, I think prob he's probably not the first person to talk about God and lightning in a place like this too. I'll, t I'll tell you that. Let, let me just switch and then I want to give some time to people here to ask some questions too. And then they do have to get back. Uh, I mean, you've been such a wizard with employment and jobs here. Is there something wrong with the picture that there's so much attention being paid to saving coal jobs, you know, in the handfuls potentially, versus the enormous opportunity for jobs in, in, in clean energy and jobs that couldn't be exported? Well, there's no question. If you're uh, learning how to be a technician on, on uh, wind farms, I mean, that job can't be exported. Uh, it's relatively, I mean, the training process is about six or eight months and the pay is great. So there are literally, I mean, there are over 60,000 clean tech jobs in Colorado. There are roughly 1,100 coal jobs. Uh, if you look back at our, at our peak, uh, you, well, let's say 10 or 15 years ago, there were a couple thousand jobs. So there is a, a mismatch, but I do think we are making a terrible mistake. I think the coal jobs are symbolic to a lot of people in this country and they represent a tremendous failing of both political parties, right? When the Democrats, Democrats used to be against any international trade, any kind of trade agreements, and Bill Clinton and a number of progressive Democrats back in the 90s kind of partnered with some of the Republicans and they did NAFTA, they did, they got agreements with China. Uh, now maybe those agreements aren't, aren't perfect and they probably do need to be improved. I don't deny that. I'm generally though someone that thinks we benefit more from trade than we do from isolation especially I think in terms of how we have relationships that help us protect the climate. Uh, but that, you know, that, uh, 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 that process, both Republicans and Democrats did it, and no one worried about the literally millions of people that were gonna lose not just their job, but their professions. And we would give someone a few months of training and say, this training should prepare you, here's some possible jobs. Somebody was reading out of a manual and then if the person couldn't find a job, which in most cases they couldn't, they were in small towns all over America. I mean, it's not just coal jobs, it's people that made furniture in North Carolina. I mean, go down the list of all those, those jobs that got outsourced and, and Detroit, all those jobs. We should have got done training at a level 10 times what we did. And if people were willing to work at it and willing to put their shoulders into it, we should have given them five years of training. If they're willing to work at training, we should train them. And the, the cost of training is relatively inexpensive. What is invaluable and irreplaceable is people's will to work and people's belief that they're not being left behind. So I agree with what you're saying, but I think the coal jobs along with the furniture jobs and all these jobs are symbolic. We're, I mean, we've got the potential now in technology. We should be able to figure out here are the skills that, that, that these people have and they're gonna lose their jobs, they're gonna lose their professions and here are the skills that we need for all these new emerging jobs like clean tech people and you know cybersecurity and, and you know we have 9,000 cybersecurity job openings in Colorado right now and two-thirds of them don't need a college degree but what is the training we're not no one's looking at 
here are the skills of all these people, let's say bank tellers. <clears throat> Robots are doing bank teller work now. They're numerate, high sense of precision. They are, you know, sense of collaboration. They work, they, they have a sense of urgency. Those same skills could work in cybersecurity, but you'd have to add some skills in between. You'd have to take a class at a community college, learn how to put computer uh, uh, code together, computer code together. Well, if you, if you take the skill, if we can figure out all the skills that people have, figure out what skills are needed to, to be acquired, and then make sure that in real time they can get whole new careers, new jobs, and ultimately new careers, that's what, that, that should be our goal. That's what we need to set as a goal. And it would cost some money, but I don't think it would cost as much money as everyone thinks. Governor, one last question, then I'm, I'm going to open it up. Coloradans seem to have a, a, a unique bond with public lands. And it's not really surprising when you see settings like this and also recognize all the oil and gas uh, under our feet. I think I've seen polls that nine in 10 Coloradans think public lands should remain public. Uh, yet I think just this morning I saw that, that the administration is proposing that you know national parks be privatized or something like that. Do you think there is a, first of all, why do you think Coloradans have that attitude? And is there some kind of connection between public lands and climate change? Um, well, Coloradans have the attitude. There are two things. Coloradans generally have come from all over the country, all over the world, and have chosen to live to, in Colorado. If you, if you were to measure the percentage of people that move to a place, not for a job or a promotion, but just to be there, I think Colorado's number one in the world. So people come from everywhere to be here. And then, you know, I've driven, I've been in every county of the state multiple times. It is the most beautiful state on earth. There, it, just, it just is. Uh, we have all different kinds of environments. We have these amazing landscapes, all different kinds. So people, when they come, they see w the way it is and they want to protect it almost, almost invariably they want to protect it. So this notion of, of public lands is something that becomes embraced by people and cherished by people that come to Colorado and they're going to fight for it. Uh, and I think, you know, the, the, our methane regulations were adopted by the BLM right. to be used on public lands all over the country. That if you're going to, you know, go in and, and, and retrieve resources, uh, you know, natural gas out of the ground, you can't waste it. You can't let it pollute. Well, now that's being thrown back and, and, and you know, debated again. We'll see. I think, I think the battle over pi private lands, I think that's going to be a place where the people of America are going to rise up and say, enough is enough. And, and actually Famous that, last words. Yeah, the, and, 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 you know, I started with the re referencing the governor's comments about states being the laboratory for experiments in clean energy. And that's a wonderful example of how this governor has actually made Colorado an example for other states when it comes to environmental regulation that's actually also pro-business. Well, we also, we have an office, we're the second state uh, to have an office of outdoor recreation. And Luis Benitez, who is, if you haven't met him, Luis Benitez is everywhere, so he's easy to find, but he's our, he's our minister of outdoor recreation. Is he here? No, I thought, I saw a shadow in the trees. There he is, <laughs> Luis! <laughs> Luis, he's, he's, climbed, he's climbed the highest mountain on every continent. He's summited Everest, I think, seven times. I mean, he's this amazing person and one of the most charismatic leaders you can have. And he's going all over the state, integrating biking trails and hiking trails, making sure they're all in a digital database that people can use with a handheld device. I mean, and his whole focus is to get more people out and more people to enjoy these public lands. And if you really want to protect public lands, have more people experience them so that they have a sense of ownership. Well, I just hope he's not trying to climb those mountains today because I already told him how dangerous they are to climb. <laughs> All right, uh, if you could have questions, and again, because we're taping this, uh, there, we aren't gonna hear it, but we're gonna ask the governor to briefly repeat it. So please make your question brief. Carlos. Well, that's much appreciated. Uh, Carlos is pointing out that the Nature Conservancies and some of these other organizations will stand beside us as we formulate and come forward with, you know, our version, how can we push, uh, make sure that we're doing everything we can to defend and protect against climate change, which we're, we're working on it full time. We've got a bunch of people on it. I think we're, we're trying to figure out if this is a time where there are going to be some new ideas that come up of how states can work together and some new ideas mm -hmm. of how municipalities in a state can work together. 
And I think that's our goal is to figure out, all right, we're going to come up with some new ideas and Montana's going to come up with some new ideas and Arizona's going to come up with some new ideas. They're going to be Republican governors, Democratic governors. We want to kind of orchestrate that as best we can. But certainly in the next month, we will, we will come forward with some ideas. Sure. So we are, as I said, in the process of trying to look at exactly what that specifically requires and, and what are the pathways by which we get to that to, to be able to say, I mean, it's not exactly immediately clear how a state, what, how do we a allocate the, the national responsibilities under Paris to the individual states? And no one really worried about that. They just said, well, we're going to we're going to go beyond Paris. We're trying to be when we come forward, I think we will be able to do this. I'm not worried about it. I think we're going to go well beyond how that gets defined, how those allocations get defined. But I want to be able to be specific. We're going to do A, B, C and D. Uh, and here's how we're going to do it. Here's how we're going to orchestrate it. And I also want to have it, uh, you know, there's always this notion, I might be wrong on this, there's this notion when something, when the federal government does something or, or some executive leader, some, some place in the federal government does something, everyone needs to rise up. There has to be a single event. We're all going to sign one thing. I wonder whether we're not served better as environmentalists and people that really do want to protect against cl climate change, if, if we're not better off having a sequence of things that are sufficiently newsworthy and, and, and new and fresh that they come, they come back into the national press. If we all signed that agreement right off the bat and we had seven governors instead of three governors or 20 governors, then where's the press going to come for the next? I mean, how do we keep this drum beat up? And I wonder whether we're not better having the states come out one or two at a time with their own fresh idea and what's new and better in their approach. And then two weeks later, two more states come out and say, we're going to do this. And I think that might be from a keeping it top of mind. For, I mean, I look at this as a, a long term battle, right? The climate deniers of which there are many and a lot of really smart people, uh, many of whom I used to respect and I still respect, <laughs> going to get in trouble. But, but I look at, you know, the, the um, I think it's a steep hill we're going up. And I think, you know, my book, uh, which Elliot kindly <laughs> plugged for the opposite of woe, that came from when I first ran for mayor and I was at 4% in the polls and I really didn't have the support I needed. And it, 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 it didn't change week after week. And I had all these young volunteers. So I carried this clipping from the, from the, the uh, Denver Post in my wallet. And it talked about a professor of public speaking at the University of Wyoming talking about the importance of using opposites when you speak publicly. You talk about the worst of times, talk about the best of times. You're going to talk about the agony, talk about the ecstasy. And she asked her class, what's the opposite of despair? Kid raised her hand, goes, joy? Exactly. You want to make people feel despair, use joy in the same sentence. Then she said, what's the opposite of woe? And a kid way in the back goes, giddy up. Right? <laughs> and, well, but, but, but why, that's, why that's the title of my book? Well, that's, that's why that's the title of my book and why I think it's a good political story is because in most cases, the opposite of woe is to giddy up, right? And I think this, when, when, when President Trump took our country out of its commitment under the Paris Agreement, we have to giddy up, right? And I think that, that means all of us not trying to attack each other. Why didn't you do this or why did you do that? But let's figure out how we can move the whole country to forward as individual states, as municipalities working together and constantly, you know, I had a, a, a writing teacher when I was in college. I, I thought I was going to be a writer. It's in the book. Um, but anyway, it turned out I was a terrible writer, but I did have some great teachers. And there's a guy named Paul Horgan. He said, he said, he walked into class one day and he said, everything has been said, but not everything has been, been said superbly. And even if it had, everything needs to be said freshly again and again. And that's where we are in climate change. We got to find ways to say it freshly again and again. And so that people hear it in different ways. And we're not just the white noise that they've gotten used to on on the cable news shows. And I think that's going to that's a challenge for all of us. It's not easy. It's, I mean, that's going to be very difficult. And I'm hopeful that, you know, Colorado, and Montana coming out with our what we're going to do together and then Colorado coming out separately. What what we're going to do next with our local communities or with our outdoor recreation industry, you know, any of these alliances, which are th I think that's where the real power is. Uh, that as we do this, it'll be fresh, right? People will hear it in a different way and say, yeah, and I believe in that. I want to support that. I'm going to, at the polls, I'm going to vote for that because a lot of this is going to translate into candidates who are going to be running for office. And, and, and 
just my perspective on this, because I'm sure a lot of you here, you went to the trouble of coming up here, you're going to get involved in elections and candidates. Try. I, I don't think it's great to have a candidate. Uh, there are lots of exceptions. I'm, just going to, I'm, I'm sure I'm going to offend someone. But we want candidates not just who are going to be in charge of or, or in favor of or, or loudly supporting defending climate change. And, you know, one one issue candidates. I think as people that care about climate change and whether we're finding candidates as de Democrats or Republicans, we want well-rounded candidates who understand about jobs and business and are really going to be able to, again, communicate the issues around climate change freshly, but are going to bring middle of the road people into the tent and, and help them in, in the political campaign, help them understand why this is so important. That's a long answer. I apologize. Well, no, it was a wonderful answer. And we, we do we do have we, we do have to end on time here. We, we all have to giddy up. We started up, late, though. Giddy up. <laughs> well, the, the, pro the problem is, no, we really didn't. I had a chance to sort of vamp about this. Oh, good. The, all right, then the we started on time. The history of the maroon bells and the geology here, knowing I couldn't be corrected by a geologist. As you, I'm the so, only governor in the history of America who has a master's in geology. <laughs> a practicing so, geologist. So let us all thank the governor for being with us here.